it's good to be back. It is good to be back. I hope you're not tired of me. <laughs> um, no, it's honestly it's a pleasure as always to be preaching um, in Mum's house, uh, the Mother Church. Um, I tell uh, Boring Wood and Watford about you guys all the time, um, and you know I'm sure they're looking forward to meeting you all. I really want you guys to meet them, um, and yeah, man, just have a Holy Ghost time. Um, I believe one or two of them will be coming to the um, Christmas dinner, um, so please do uh, you know introduce yourselves to them. Um, amen, amen. So today, um, this evening, uh, I'm going to preach a word on character. Now, I didn't have a fancy title for this. It is what it is. It's one of those uh, evenings I'm preaching on character today, and this is a sermon that is challenging me. Um, even as I preach it, I'm preaching it to myself. So I hope you'll be attentive um, as I minister a word. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, please turn to uh, 1 Samuel 16, uh, verse 5 to 13. Uh, the scripture should be up on the screens, but if you've got your Bibles, how many know it's good to have a physical Bible, amen? Come to church, physical Bible. But if you don't have it, it will be up there for you. So, before I get into the, to the word and um, ministering, there's a man called Stanislav Petrov. This man is a, a Russian man. Uh, during the 1980s, there was a lot of uh, issues and problems between Russia and, uh, and uh, the US. And basically what was happening is they were in a period called the Cold War. The Cold War, um, no missiles or you know, people were actually, uh, I believe, not too many people died in the war. Uh, but it was a war of tension. And, you know, even living throughout the 80s, I mean, I was born in 1989, so, you know, I, I, I don't obviously remember it. Um, but, you know, you ask anybody from the 80s, they would have felt a tension between these two and living through it, uh, threats of nuclear war and all sorts of violence. And there was this man called Stanislav Petrov, and they nicknamed him the man who was credited to have saved the world. You know, forget Superman, forget Batman, forget the Marvel comics, this man is the real life Superman. And he had the authority from the Russian side to launch nuclear missiles during the Cold War. He was the man uh, that put the final call out to, um, if he received a call from the government, to make a decision to fire these nuclear missiles. One day in 1983, Stanislav Petrov received a warning that the US had launched six nuclear bombs, not one, not two, but six nuclear bombs from a warning system, and you imagine he's in a control room, he had moments to respond. Um, the story goes that he had 45 minutes to respond to this call. You've got to imagine there's people looking at him, and they're ready to do whatever. You know, they're ready to you know, press whatever button they need to release this and let go of that and everything else to you know, instigate a nuclear uh, war, pretty much. But what happened was, in that 45 minutes, which he described to be probably the most stressful time in his entire life, he literally had the world's future in the balance, and he perceived it to be a false alarm, and, and actually, you know, caused, uh, you know, told everyone, you know, we're calling it off, we're not going to launch a retaliate, uh, retaliatory attack. And in that, he saved the entire world. Disobeying orders and not launching a retaliatory attack caused the world to be saved. And the world is as we know it today. It, the world would be a completely different world if it hadn't been for this man. But all of this couldn't have happened if this man hadn't developed a character. A character to withhold, a character to say no, a character to say not yet, a character not to listen to his comrades and people saying they're launching an attack. We've got to retaliate. He had to have character. Can you say amen? So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at another man in the Bible by the name of David and look at how his character shone in the eyes of God. So we're going to look into the scripture today in 1 Samuel 16, verse 5 to 13. Amen. Read with me today, uh, verse 5. And he said, peaceably... I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. 
sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then he uh, consecrate, consecrated Jesse and his sons, not that one over there, <laughs> and invited them to the sacrifice. So it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For the man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Verse 8. So Jesse called Abinadab, this is the, 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 the other son, and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Thus, Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, are all of the young men here? He's starting to get confused. He's like, I'm here for a mandate. God has called me here to anoint the next king. I've seen all of your sons. God has said no. What is going on? And he says, Samuel says to Jesse, are all the men here? And then he said, there remains yet the youngest. And there he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. Verse 12. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Verse 13, then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Amen. Let's pray, church. Lord, I thank you today for this time. Thank you for this opportunity, Lord, the blessing of ministering your word today. Lord, speak to your people today, I pray. Lord, help us to understand the character that we need, Lord, to persevere, to carry on, and to inspire others. We thank you in advance for all that you're going to do today in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. amen. We're going to have a good time today, but first what we're going to do is we're going to look at aesthetics over character. Somebody say it. Aesthetics over character. Aesthetics over character. We live in a day and age where we glorify aesthetics. Let's be honest today. You know, a lot of us would have done our Christmas shopping and we're going to be buying clothes for our significant other, friends, family, etc. Just a little tip, if you're buying clothes for people, make sure you keep the receipt because if you're anything like me, I get the sizes wrong and I end up having to go through that awkward thing. But we are living in a society today that is consumed by aesthetics. Let me give you a quick example. There's a man named Jeremy Mix, uh, Meeks. And in 2014, this gentleman, Jeremy Meeks, a.k.a. Prison Day, went viral. Now, Kapil, I'm going to ask you to put the um, picture up. Who remembers this gentleman here? Yeah? Yeah, I see a couple of ladies smiling. Yes, yes, it is him. Stay in the spirit. Stay in the spirit. I'm joking. <laughs> Amen. This is Prison Bay. Now, Prison Bay is a, uh, a former Crip uh, gang member. So he was raised in uh, Stockton, uh, Los Angeles. Um, he was actually uh, arrested in 2014 during a gang sweep. Um, in Stockton, L.A. And what happened was he was convicted on federal charges. So this is, these are serious charges of possession of a firearm and grand theft. And what happened was while this man was in prison, the police took a mugshot of him and put it on Facebook. I don't know why the police would do that, but they put his mugshot on Facebook. And from that day forward, he was known as Prison Bay, okay, a.k.a the world's hottest criminal. I mean, this is their words, you know. Take, take from it what you will. <laughs> but this man here became world famous in literally a couple of days because of his aesthetics. Can you say amen? This is a man who was a thief. This is a man who was a violent man. This is a man who was carrying guns and firearms and a violent man, but it seemed... For, for all intents and purposes, like the world didn't care. They just cared that he looked good. 
How many people know the world values aesthetics over character? The Bible talks about dangers of valuing aesthetics before character. In Proverbs 5, verse 3 to 6, it speaks about a young adulterous woman. In verse uh, 3 to, to 6, it says, For the lips of an adulterous woman drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as gall, sharp as a double-edged sword. Verse, uh, verse 5, I believe, Her feet go down to death. Her steps lead straight to the grave. She gives no thought to the way of her life. Her path wanders aimlessly, but she does not know it. In this scripture right here, this is a woman that the book of Proverbs is describing. She is good looking. She knows how to say the right things. She looks nice. You know, uh, you know there's a couple of examples of, of, of people that I can liken this woman to. But the Bible says her feet go down to death. She can look nice, she can say the right things, she can look the right way, but the reality of it is nothing good is coming out of her life because she has no character. Can you say amen? amen. I just want to send a word out to the ladies. Ladies, you don't want to marry a man with no character. Can you say amen? amen? Let me just say that again. You don't want to marry a man with no character. This is a man who looks good, but he's got no self-control. He looks good, he knows how to put you know, his, his suit together. He can match his tie with his socks, you know. He, he, can, he can say the right things. But the problem is, is that there's nothing about him because he lacks character. Always wanting to have his own way. Always wanting to throw a strop. These are the types of men that will come to church. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll cut their eye at their missus or, you know, they'll go home in a strop. They'll, they'll do silent treatment. All of these things... These are symptoms of a man that lacks character. How many people know, ladies, you don't want to be with a man that lacks character. Can you say amen? amen? He can look good. He can say the right things. But if there's certain things lacking in his life, his steps will lead to death. A man who smells good but has no practical life skills. This man can smell like Gucci, Prada, Tom Ford, Creed, Aventus, all those things. But the reality of it is, is that's not going to pay your bills. Can you say amen? amen? You might have a six-pack, but the six-packs won't pay your bills. Unless he's a model, then maybe the six-pack will pay your bills. But what good is that if he can't provide for you, doesn't have the character to keep a job? This is a man who may have all the muscles in the right places, but won't fight for you. I remember being in a gym with, uh, with a young man, just in Watford. I'm working out with him. And when I tell you this man has trapezius muscles, he's got the little muscle over here and he's got the vein that pops out as well. He's got muscle on muscle. He's got muscles I didn't even know existed on his, on his, on his bicep. But when I spoke to him, he spoke to me about how he was terrified of getting into a fight. Terrified of getting into a fight. I'm like, bro, all those muscles. This is when in the world you used to call people big for nothing. <laughs> You're big for nothing. <laughs> All the muscles in the world, but no character. Can you say amen? amen? Can't defend you. God wants to speak to us about character today. Can you say amen? amen? Don't be fooled by the aesthetics. Don't be fooled by the words that a person might speak or how they might look. But what is their character? Are there a man of prayer? Are there a woman? Is, is it a woman that will look after another lady that's come, into, come to know Christ? Is, does this person actually have godly character or are they all talk? Can you say amen? God wants to speak to us about character today. So my second point is, what are the ingredients of good character? Because we see this scene play out with David and his brothers. Jesse is the father. He's a father to about eight, at least eight sons. Uh, you've got Shammah, you've got Abinadab, you've got a number of these men. And they're basically, you know, they're strong, strapping men, they look good, they look the part, and Jesse in his mind is like, Samuel, you've come at the right day, man. I've lined up my boys. One of them must be king, because look at the muscles, look at the biceps, look at the, you know, the trapezius muscles and all of this kind of stuff, you know, muscles in all of the right places, shiny Colgate teeth. These people, these young boys must be the next in line to be king. But it was actually King uh, David at the time. David was tending to the sheep. 
I mean, when Samuel, imagine being David at the time, you know, uh, Jesse, uh, you know, Father Jesse has called up all of his favorite sons to come, but he hasn't bothered to call up this little boy over here, his youngest, because he didn't think that he was even worthy to be there at the time. Imagine being David. But God chose David because he looked beyond what man sees. Can you say amen? He looked at the character of the man. So we're going to talk about what is it about David's life that God was so drawn to? What was it about David that God saw and said, this is the person that I'm going to anoint as king of Israel? The first, I believe, is humility. David was in the farm. If you read the scriptures, it talks about how David was tending to the sheep. When his brothers were flexing indoors and, you know, pumping weights and, you know, uh, uh, you know, doing all sorts of stuff to make sure that they looked the part, David was actually out there handling business. The Bible talks about how he fought the lion and the bear. He was taking care of the sheep. He was, you know, doing what he needed to do. And even later on, what you read is that as David is anointed king, you know, 20 years later, he still references to himself as a shepherd. This is a man who never lost who he was. How many people know when you step up and you go through the gears of life, sometimes you can forget who you were when you first began. Can you say amen? You can forget the, 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 the ruddy, um, you know, 15, 16-year-old boy who came into church, didn't know nothing about the Bible whatsoever, but now, you know, you're, you're, you're preaching, you're out there, you're doing your thing. You've forgotten where you come from. How many know that's a lack of humility? Can you say amen? David never forgot who he was. He still referenced, even when he was king, he referenced to himself as a shepherd. That's humility. I just want to make a quick point here. Humility isn't putting yourself down. Because a lot of people seem to think that humility is, you know, making yourself to be a lot lower than you actually are. Humility is actually recognizing exactly who you are in Christ. That means if you are, you know, if you're the usher, you're the usher. You know, if you are the pastor, you're the pastor. You know, false humility will have it that, you know, if you're the pastor, you'll, you'll, you'll think that you're something else. But no, if God has called you to be something, that's what you are. And true humility is recognizing exactly who you are. David didn't mind serving, and that was actually the quality that qualified him for leadership. You see, people were thinking, oh, the next king is going to look like King Saul. The previous king was actually, you know, he was really, really tall. You know, he was really good looking. Uh, he had long hair, long flowing locks. But God said, I want to do something different. I want to pick somebody that you wouldn't think that I would pick. And that is so like God. Can you say amen? amen? One of my favorite scriptures in 1 Corinthians talks about how, you know what, not many of us were wise, not many of us were noble, but God has chosen the, God has chosen the foolish, foolish things. Amen. Foolish things of the world. Not many of us came to church wise and knowing our Bible and knowing our scriptures, but God in, in our weakness, fashioned us and formed us in humility, and we should never forget that. Can you say amen? amen? The second ingredient that I believe that we need is processing afflictions. You see, one thing that David did was he processed afflictions well. Can you say amen? He was a man that when he went through hard times in life, he knew how to repent. When he went through difficult times in life where he compromised his salvation... What happened was he came back to God and he repented because he processed life well. Romans 5 verse 1 to 4. Kapil, if you can help me out today. Romans 5 verse 1 to 4 says this. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. Now I want you to pay close attention to this bit. Now we boast in the hope of the glory of God, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. My question to you today is this, how do you see your problems? Do you see your problems as a hindrance? You know, you, you, you are on your way to church and you get a flat tire. You know, you were, you know, faithfully 
doing your thing and, and, and following Christ, but a family tragedy happens. How do you see the problems in your life? Because sometimes your problems are there to build your character. Can you say amen? Not all problems are issues and from the devil. Sometimes God sends you some challenges to build your character. But if you're always looking at your challenges in life like, oh, get behind me, Satan, you may never learn anything from it. Because perseverance, suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. The third ingredient is, is actually perseverance. One thing that we can tell from David's life is, is he actually pressed through. When he was going through problems and issues in life, when King Saul wanted to kill him, David pressed through. The Bible actually talks about how Saul wanted to kill David and David had a chance to get his revenge, but he chose not to. The reason why is because he didn't act out of anger. Why? Because he had character. Can you say amen? amen. Now, um, now, Keith uh, Machunga can probably um, clarify this, but in Gloucester, Gloucestershire, 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 did I get it right? In Gloucestershire, they have this annual festival called Cheese Rolling. Now, you can look it up afterwards. It's the funniest thing ever. So this cheese rolling thing, what happens is, is they roll this big cheese down a hill. Now, there's this massive hill in Gloucestershire, and they roll this cheese down a hill, and then like maybe like 100 people run after this, this cheese down a hill. It's the, one of the dumbest things I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> but, but listen, but listen. When people are rolling down this hill, what invariably happens is one person trips up, falls over, and then it's like a chain reaction. Everyone else trips up over everybody else. People actually travel to do this. It's, it's a madness. When you get a chance, YouTube, cheese rolling, you won't be disappointed. They roll down the hill, and they roll down with this cheese, right? This massive cheese. Real, true stories. And, <laughs> and as they're rolling down this hill... They fall over. But the most incredible thing about it is, is they get back up and they continue running after this cheese. They fall over and they get back up. They fall down and they get back up until they reach the end of the hill and then one man lifts up the cheese and everyone gives him a round of applause. Do you know what that tells me? There are times in life where you're going to tumble, where you're going to fall. But how many people know as soon as you fall, you get back up? You fall, you get back up. You fall and you get back up. Why? Because as you persevere, it produces character. Can you say amen? As you persevere in this, in this crazy Christian life that we live in where it feels as though the minute we got saved, things got harder instead of easier. We persevere because perseverance produces character and character hope. Can you say amen? Third point today, why do we need character anyway? As I mentioned before, character produces hope. And um, you may be going through things in your life and you're thinking to yourself, why are you sending me through this trial, Lord? You know, I've got illnesses in my body that I've had pastors and evangelists and various people pray for and I don't seem to be getting healed. Lord, I'm going through barrenness, not just in my, in, in my, in my spiritual life, but you know, maybe you're a, you're, a, you're a couple and you're trying for a child and things aren't working out, etc. You're going through problems in your life and issues and you're wondering, what is the meaning of this? God, why would you put me through this? I'm serving you. I'm doing the right thing. I'm going to morning prayer. I'm coming to midweek uh, service. I'm coming even to Sunday evening service. I'm waking up in the morning praying. Why are you taking me through this? I want to tell you today that when you go through things in your life, you're going through them sometimes so that other people can reference off of you when you overcome. When you overcome these issues, you know, when you overcome barrenness, when you overcome illness and you're healed in Jesus' name, you can turn around and say, this happened because I persevered and through me getting this miracle, it's produced hope in somebody else. Because character produces hope. Can you say amen? Amen. There was a survey that runs um, a large sample. So basically, um, they, they process a large sample of millionaires. And what happens is, is that they, they look at the attributes of some of these millionaires, you know, to try and figure out what was their big secret. 
What caused these people to become successful in life? What caused these people to make them the amount of money that they made? And can I tell you, it wasn't the school that they went to. A lot of people think I'm going to send my child to private school. It doesn't mean they're going to become a millionaire. Just putting it out there. I went to private school. That's why I can say that. <laughs> Not a millionaire. <laughs> it wasn't that they were tall. It wasn't the school that they went to. And it wasn't how much their family made and were worth. Do you know what the deciding factor was? It was a character trait called grit. Grit. That when things weren't going well, when they had started a business and things weren't you know, happening in the way that they, they thought it was, they stuck it through and then they grinded their way through life and eventually saw the victory. Why? Because they had character in their life. Can you say amen? They had a grit. And I want to say that if you want to reach the, the, the true riches of the kingdom of God, you're going to need to have a bit of grit in your life. You know, rain can't stop you coming to church. Can you say amen? <laughs> amen. Rain can't stop you coming to, 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 to Bible study and, and outreach. You see a little bit of snow. You know, we had crazy weather over the past couple of weeks. Minus one. I, I can't tell you the last time I saw minus two and minus one. Crazy. But you know what? Some of us still hit the streets and share the gospel with people. Why? Because we have character. Can you say amen? And character produces hope. Do you know what else character produces? Character produces confidence. You know, your, your pastor, Pastor Jimmy, I'm sure Pastor Jimmy has, has, has visions of people rising up in church and doing something incredible for God. But it's just that the way that sometimes we live for God doesn't produce much confidence in him making that decision to put us into a certain ministry. Are you hearing what I'm saying this evening? He could be looking at someone and saying, I've, I've this, that man's got so much potential. That man's got so, he can sing like Kirk Franklin or whoever. You know, he can, he can rap like Lecrae or whatever, but he won't come to church on time. You know, he can do all of the things that, you know, he's got gifting, he's got talent, he's blessed. But the issue is, is I can't count on him. I don't have any confidence in him because he doesn't have the character. You see, God wants to bless us. He wants to put us in certain places. But he won't put us in certain places if we don't have the character in order to carry us and to keep us going and to persevere through that period of time. Character should produce confidence. By the time David went to the throne... People knew that he could be trusted. Why? Because he had character. When David went to fight Goliath, you know, people looked at him like, who's this young boy? You know, if, you know, the people were Nigerian at the time, they would have said, who's this small boy? Small boy. Who's this young boy coming here to try and face this big Goliath beast of a man? But what they didn't realize is David had slain the lion, he had slain the bear, and he would make Goliath this uncircumcised Philistine like one of these and that's exactly what he did by the time he got to the throne people were like listen man that boy he can lead us because he's been through some things he's got some character can you say amen if you want to be a man of God if you want to be a woman of God you have to have character you have to have gone through things and come out the other way with a testimony can you say amen don't give up but just keep going in closing I want to speak to you about a um a young man, uh, his name was Maurice Wilson. And Maurice Wilson, I think it was around like the 1920s, um, he was hell bent on climbing Mount Everest. There was this thing where, you know, very few people had climbed Mount Everest and he was like, I'm gonna be one of the first people to do it. The problem is, is this man didn't train. He didn't train, he didn't go to the gym, he didn't do his oxygen training or whatever you call it or whatever they had in the 1920s. But what happened was, against all wise judgment, he smuggled himself onto this mountain. So all his friends told him, don't do it, man. Maurice, you're not ready. You're not ready, bro. And he was like, forget you guys, man. I'm going to climb Mount Everest. I'm going to be world famous. This man smuggled himself onto the mountain and then asked two locals to accompany him. These locals, these are professional climbers, okay? So these guys have been up and down the mountain a couple of times. But even when they saw him, they said, even with our help, you're not going to get far. So they abandoned him. Maurice, against their judgment, said, I'm going to climb Mount Everest anyway. I'm going to be the first man to do it, even without these guys. 
Do you know what happened to poor Maurice? Maurice died on that mountain. He died on that mountain. And the report came back saying that they don't know what killed him. But I can reveal to you what killed Maurice. Stupidity and pride. (laughs) Can you say amen? Stupidity and pride. Feeling as though he could take a task when he didn't have the character to take it through. If we're going to be people of God today that are able to stand, you know, how many people know we're living in an evil age at the moment? So much madness going on. People are coming to Christ. Yes, we know, and we have the victory, but there's madness going on, and we're going to need to be increasingly, as the time comes, that we're going to need to be people of character that can hold ourselves, that can say, no, we're not going to do this. No, we're not going to be involved in that. No, my child's not going to be involved in that. Why? Because I'm a person of character. Can you say amen? Pastor Jimmy is, is possibly like, you know, he's a big inspiration for me. The reason why is because when he took over this church, a lot of kind of confusion and a lot of things kind of happening. But when he took over the church, I believe it was about three, three and a half years ago. Correct me if I'm wrong. But he took over the church and his, I believe his great, his granddaughter, uh, great granddaughter, um, or his, his daughter had a miscarriage. Soon as he took over the church, his daughter had a miscarriage. Now, it's, it's mad enough taking over a church in the situation that we were in. We were without a building and various other things were happening. But Pastor Jimmy decided to take on the church anyway, even with that on his, on his back. Not long after that, a couple months after that, his mother passed away. Mum passed away. And that would have been enough for people just to say, you know what, I'm checking out of this. I don't want to be involved in this. You know, this is too much. Madness is going on. The devil was attacking him aggressively. And I could see it just looking at him as a disciple. I'm like, wow, this is, this is taking its toll. What are you going to do? But he pressed on. His wife, Eula, became sick. And he continued to outreach. He continued to do what he was called to do. Can you say amen? Because when God gives you a vision and a dream, you pursue it and you persevere. And he went on and on until, unfortunately, Sister Eula, uh, she passed away. And on that Sunday, one of the most inspiring things that I saw was on that Sunday, he preached. Do you know how hard that is? Madness, craziness is going on. The devil is wrecking havoc in your family. People are dying left, right, and center. You know, I think even his, his cousin passed away as well, not long after that. But he's still pressing on and he's still doing what he needs to do. Why? Because he's a man of character. Can you say amen? He's a man of character. And when I remember when we got sent out, he sat me, you know, Matthew, and a couple of other people down. And um, he said, remember this. Remember what I went through. Go out there and do us proud. Go out there and do us proud. And what he was, I believe he was saying was, listen, I was a man of character, so be a man of character out there. When I went out, I, I went through some, some, some mad times, some very interesting times in, in Watford. And I remember, you know, there were times where I didn't want to outreach. There were times where I didn't want to go out onto the streets and share the gospel. And, you know, I know, you know, you get sent out and, you know, you've got all this momentum and everything, but, you know, things aren't going right, things aren't happening, disciples ain't getting it, all of this stuff. And you're on outreach or you're about to go outreach and your bed is calling you. It's seven o'clock at night and you're like, listen, wifey's cooked up some jollof rice, some cooked up some chicken, you know, the kids, you know, you want to spend time with them as well. And then I open the door and it's like blizzard, just, just looking at this and I'm looking at this. Where, where am I going to go? And I'm like, you know what, let me, let me go out there, man. Let me go out there. And the reason why I made that decision was like, listen, my pastor went out there when he was going through hell. And if he can do it, I have no excuse whatsoever. <laughs> Guys, we, we have no excuse whatsoever to not serve God. We must serve God. Look at the examples that we have. We, we only have to look as far as our pastor. You know, some of the, 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 the great men here, you know, there's certain people that have been through wars over the years to see you have what we have today. We're sitting on these lovely plush chairs, but these, these plush chairs, they were, they were bought with a price. 
And I'm not just talking about money. You know, just spiritual warfare, fighting, contending, building one, building lost, this happening, all of this craziness happening, stuff that you are not even aware of to have what we have today. And we're literally on the shoulders of giants. Why? Because people had character. How much more you today? Is that you? When pastor gives a call for outreach, are you the type of person to say, you know what, I don't care if it's minus five degrees out there. I'm going to go out there and share my faith with somebody. Maybe there's someone out there that got kicked out of their mom's house and needs the gospel. I'm going to go out there and be the person that I need to be for that person. Or are you the type of person to say, you know what, I can talk the talk, but I can't walk the walk. I'd rather stay at home. Which one are you today? Let's be people of character, church. Can you say amen? Amen. 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 Let's give God a clap of praise as we bow our heads today. Amen. No fancy title today. I honestly, I didn't get around to thinking of one. But I literally just named this sermon character. Character. It's not about how nice you look. It's not about how big the circumference of your biceps is. How fast you can run. How white your teeth are. How nice your dress is. All those things are great and God bless you if you've got all of that. But listen, what we need more than anything is character. What this world lacks is character. People that would say, regardless of what is going on, I'm going to stick to the stuff. Why? Because I want to be an example to another person. I want to demonstrate real character. There are going to be times over the next couple of months, even years, where your character is going to be tested. Where you're going to be left to make a decision. Are you going to go left or are you going to go right? But as you make that decision, just remember that your decision will bear consequences, not just on yourself, but others. I believe when the scripture talked about how suffering produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope, what the scripture was saying was that our decisions don't just affect us. But when this character is produced in our life, we emanate and we radiate hope to others. When we go through hard times in life and we come out the other end with Jesus, that signals to other people that they can make it in Christ. That they don't have to give up at the first hurdle. That they don't go, have to go back to their drugs or go back to their crystals or go back to their judge or yoga or meditation because Jesus has power. Jesus has dominion. And they will know that because they can look at your life and say, they went through it with Jesus and they got through the other end. Church, let's be a people of character. Just changing the order of the call today. Maybe you're in this place, you're not saved, you're not born again. Let me make this simpler. You're not on your way to heaven. You don't have a relationship with God. If you were to die today, if God forbid you were to leave this church without Christ, and the 182 bus was to slam into you and you were to breathe your last, the moment you open your eyes, it wouldn't be good news for you. You're in that place today. You don't have a relationship with God the way that you should. You know that there are things in your life that are stopping you from, from, from even entering into a relationship, let alone having a better one. But you want to make things right with God today. 
and you're here today and you're saying, preacher, I want to make things right. I've been talking the talk. I've been saying amen, hallelujah. I've been, you know, copying and pasting scriptures on my, on my Instagram and my WhatsApp status, but I don't have Jesus. But I want to make things right today. I can tell you today, good news is that you can. And with an uplifted hand, signifying it with an uplifted hand, you can say, Lord, I don't know you as I should, but I want to make things right with you today. Not born again, not saved in this place, but you want to make things right with Jesus. Just put, signify that with an upraised hand. Just put your hand up and put your hand down. Left to right, up and down in this place. You're not born again. You don't know Jesus in the way that you should, but you want to make things right with your Savior today. Just signify that with an upraised hand. Just put it up and put it down today. Amen. Amen. Saints, let's be people of character. Let's be people that don't just talk the talk, but walk the walk. People that don't just post, you know, God first on our status, but we're doing anything but what God is calling us to do in our lives. But let's be people of character, of godly character, that will persevere, that will be about this life spiritually. Amen. The altars are now open. You can come to the front and pray. Amen. Let's seek God in this place. Let's come to the altar. Let's pray. Let's get a hold of God in this place. Amen. The altars are now open. Amen. Lord, I thank you today.